Okay, so I'm here with Katharina, uh, Katharina McLeod, who just published a book called From Flux to Festivity, International Art in Lund's Konsthal 1965-67, which is a book on events and exhibitions Lund, around Lund in the mid-60s. I think, at least, I would say I, w I really don't know a lot about it. So I think it's a very interesting book because it shows that perhaps a bit of a hidden part of Swedish art history. So can you tell me how this book came about, about the context of the book? Okay, so thank you for that, and I agree that it's such interesting material to bring forth, finally. And its starting points are many. It's uh, partly a personal history, events and exhibitions that I've heard of my whole life. I know one of the people involved, uh, one of the key people in the network uh, doing this exhibition. So it's something I've always known of. It's also exhibitions and events that are... I mean, I studied art history in London in the, during the 90s, and people knew of it. There was no secret no. there. So it's got this kind of history. So for me, it's like um, interesting to look at it from a historian's perspective now that I look back a little bit more on time uh, during that period. Uh, so I had like a personal knowledge. I had now also a professional interest, because what I've always been interested in is to look slightly on on side returns, you know, a little bit on the side of the mainstream or of the canonized artists or the mainstream narratives or to look again. And I think these exhibitions that I've been writing about um, are at the core of the mainstream but never talked about as, as specific events. No. So some of the artists are really the big names but the exact exhibitions have never mm. been dealt with. And why? Maybe we can discuss it. Yeah. Also, the, the, the director of Lund's Consal uh, mm. seems to be a pretty flamboyant person. I mean, I ne I've never heard of him either. <laughs> he, what's his background? So, the director of Lund's Consal is called, uh, was called Eje Hergestedt, mm. and he was the first director as Lund's Consal was inaugurated in 1957. He was a student from Lund, you know, I think an art critic, part of the local southern Sweden art scene, Skåne. Uh, got this job um, and had a program that in many ways are quite similar to what happened at Moderna mm. Museet. I mean, he showed the big masters, you know, you had uh, Anders <laughs> you know, but you also had um, contemporary Italian sculptor, scul sculptures and Norwegian graphic yeah. and so on and so forth. Very similar program, if you look in detail at yeah. the archives of Moderna. Um, but he also had a very close connection to artists in particularly two places. One is in Paris, particularly through the artist Gianni Bertini, Italian artist uh, living and working in, in uh, Paris. But he also had a hub in Poland. So this is something else that's come out of my research, but it's not present in this book no. particularly. His strong relationship <coughs> with the Eastern art uh, scene, I mean Eastern the, European art scene. I mean, uh, the presence... I also heard you know, that there was a presence of, of fluxes in the South mm. Sweden, all these rumors. Is, is that connected somehow to these exhibitions? Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, so what I write about are four events. Mm. It's uh, two major exhibitions, mm. uh, called one called Le Merveilleux Modern, mm. uh, the second Superlund, the second is by the critic Pierre Restani, yeah. which we might come to talk about, yeah. and then uh, the first one by Jean-Jacques Levesque. But around these two exhibitions was also organized by some of the people who exhibited in the exhibitions uh, two events, and particularly then by Paula Manget, yeah. who is also uh, somebody I, I know. Um, the first evening in 1965 was on the opening night of the Mervia Modern, which had uh, one evening of uh, sets, different happenings. And fluxus, I think, is uh, not the right term. It was a contested term, as you write. Very yeah. contested term. Some of these artists were fluxus artists, uh, like Ben, mm. uh, Ben Vautier, but he called Ben, B-E-N. <laughs> uh, he was partly a fluxus artist. Mm. Some were not, like Bernard Heidsick, who was an action poet. Uh, they, they had um, uh, Brian Geisin, centerpiece. Mm. They were one of their friends from Paris. Um, so that was one evening of quite unexpected and possibly unprecedented yeah. sort of yeah. happenings. They called it happenings or festivities. Uh, the other event was a couple of months bef in 67, a couple of months before the last event that I write about, the last exhibition. So 
um, it was three days, a whole weekend full of uh, more openly fluxes events, but not only fluxes. They had a question mark on one of the posters because it's a contested term, so some people would never go send their work unless flux if it goes called fluxes. But if you put fluxes question mark, okay, I send it uh, because of the relationship. So that was an international event. I don't think I answered your question about its relationship to Skåne. No, but I'm thinking was, uh, was, uh, there was like there were like you know these. I mean, movements that were, as it were, marginal in, in the in, in the mainstream sphere, like you know, like a situation is when Fluxus had a presence in South mm. Sweden. Does. I never did any research. It's just heard rumors about it. So mm. I was wondering if that was connected with these, mm. like these exhibitions, caused like you know, you know as it were, um, ripples in the waters. So, mm. so there was a continuous presence of Fluxus mm. artists. Is, is that true? I think it's uh, one can. It's it's um, there were local artists mm. like somebody called Bengt Rukke who had massive events, which I only briefly mention in this book, um, who was based in Lund uh, and who had massive, <laughs> massive events. He, had, he put fire to the South Korean flag in uh, what's called Lundagon, the park in yeah, Lund. Yeah. 500 people were there, police was there, it was massive articles. And this was marketed as some kind of happening slash fluxus event. And he also had performances which they wouldn't call it happenings at Lunds Costa during that time. But I think it's mostly connected to both the uh, relationships with the Fluxus artists in Copenhagen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is still only a boat ride. Yeah. And so the artists in Skåne and the curators or the gallery directors uh, had this relationship with the Dan Danish mm. art scene, mm. but also directly with Paris. Mm. Mostly, I would say. <laughs> Somebody like Robert Filio, who participates uh, with a piece, he was married to a Danish woman, so he had a presence in Denmark. He knew the liaisons. And so it's personal networks, mostly, that drives this, and interests from particularly Eja Hagestad. So who was the, how was the critical reception? I, I mean, one can assume that these works, or these actions or happenings, mm. Whereas you said pretty much unprecedented in the Swedish mm. scene, specifically in Lund, I would say. Mm. So how was the critical reception? Okay, so first it means what you mean with critical perception. Well, I mean the, I mean the press. <laughs> the press. Or, yeah. So it's so the uh, I mean the press love it. Yeah. The tabloid, if you call it like like Kvelsposten, yeah. not really a tabloid in yeah. sense, yeah. but they love it. Yeah. They're like, this is finally something happening in Lund. The first event, event, I think people were in shock. And uh, people were calling in and complaining. It was too sexual. It was marketed as a, in Swedish, kultur evening, a cultural evening, which has bourgeois 19th yeah, century yeah. connotations. Uh, and so I, I can just imagine people coming <laughs> to this kultur evening and having Brian Geisen's piece where it's uh, sex and shootings and <laughs> all sorts of things happening, stones being thrown across the sea, stage, you yeah. know, things that then wasn't really uh, what was normally like classical music no. or poetry. Um, the second event, 1967, the event called, um, uh, what's it called? A flux, no, it's called Fest, Fest something something, Oxo. Festivity, maybe. Festivity, some kind of thing, something with the festivity, really yeah. long, and many different titles yeah, also, yeah. depending on which uh, protocols you look at. Um, that was received with words like, finally, something interesting happens in this underdeveloped country. We are like the Eastern Bloc uh, in Sweden in terms of influence. Yeah. Finally, the, the international art scene comes and shows yeah. us the recent, most recent work. And this last, that second mm. happening event over the three days, had artists that are at the core mm. of uh, Flux's history. So why do you think then that this, of course, I mean, I mean, the answer is obvious, but still we can speak a little bit more about this. I mean, why was this then, I mean, subsequently so pretty marginalized in Swedish art history? Was it because of the presence of Moldam Seat that mm. took all the limelight? Is that, is that true? And was, was, you know, was, was there kind of irritation in Lund that this yeah. wasn't somehow acknowledged in Stockholm? <laughs> I think uh, probably that at least I was irritated yeah, yeah. being from Lund, yeah. having studied partly in Lund. Uh, I think that was one of the reasons, one of the things nagging me a little bit like, hang on, there's a book after book, PhD after PhD mm. <laughs> about those, that period at, in Stockholm. Mm. And um, I was just very basically thinking, well, there's other hist there are other histories that are worthwhile uh, discussing. Yeah. But I'm also interested in a more, uh, I don't know if you can call it, 
methodological or theoretical conundrum in art history uh, based on the idea of centre and periphery, which is really like at the core of art history, yeah. an understanding of centre and periphery in many different aspects. Uh, and that was something in my larger research project. Yeah. This is a derivative of a larger research so project. So what is the larger project? You say the larger project, oh, the title. Maybe it's a big... It's, uh, you know, yeah, how, yeah. how many hours have you got? But it's called uh, International Art Exhibitions uh, during the Cold War period, I think. Okay. No, exhibitions in the periphery. Oh, which is pretty big. International Art Exhibitions in the Periphery, or something like yeah, that. Something yeah. periphery, something uh, with a yeah, question mark. Okay. It's uh, together with two colleagues, okay. uh, Marta Edling and a PhD student, Pella Mishtaner. Okay. Uh, and we are looking at all the different exhibitions at different archives, Moderna, National mm -hmm. Museum, Lilia Valks, Gothenburg Art Museum, Lund Kostal, mm. Malmö Kostal, looking at everything. Mm. If we look at everything, which narratives come for? So how does this, this is just a part, but how does that, how does this fit into this larger frame then? That's so this, uh, uh, these exhibitions and events was my starting point mm. for uh, writing up this project. Mm. If we can find such interesting exhibitions hiding mm. in the archives, yeah. and they really were hiding. I mean, I had to go and look at board uh, pr protocols to yeah. find out which which artworks were even there, how can you even map out the artworks? Um, what other things are hiding in these archives? Mm. I'm thinking per perhaps, I mean, what happened after 67, you know, it's, it's, a very, it's a very brief moment in time, 65, 65, 67. Mm. What happened afterwards? Mm. I mean, was, was there a continuous was there a continued presence of these kind of works in them, or, or did it just stop for 67? Okay, so what happened after 67 mm. is that Eja Hagestet moved on to Södertälje and started up Södertälje Art Gallery, Södertälje Konsthall, for a couple of years. And then 73, 74, he was part of inaugurating Malmö Konsthall. Mm. But he was still in Lund at the same time, or he moved? No, he moved on. But yeah. Lund's Constal obviously yeah, yeah, continued yeah, sure, sure. under yeah, new director. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was drama going on at Lund's Constal for a year. Uh, but then uh, they had a new director. So at Lund's Constal, uh, they continued a program which is very much painting a picture of 1970s cultural politics. Yeah. Everything from a lot of um, exhibitions of uh, craft, mm. for example. You have really interesting NGO exhibitions supporting people in, in need from early 70s to into the 80s, like the big exhibition uh, Art Against Apartheid, a big international touring exhibition. Eja um, Hagestet, however, he continued both his program with collaborating with particularly artists in France, um, but also with artists in Poland apart from the other type of program yeah, with yeah, big masters yeah, and graphic yeah, art yeah, and yeah. whatever have you. So, uh, if, we, if we go to the second exhibition, uh, which is now called uh, Lund, what was it? Super Lund. Super Lund, yeah, yeah. The presence of Pierre Estani, which is perhaps a bit forgotten today, but mm. was a very key player in, in criticism. Who was Pierre Estani? Can you... Okay, so Pierre Estani is a character and a half. Yeah. I mean, his mm. history is amazing. He's this uh, French uh, critic, comes out of a peripheral region in France, moves to Paris, deals a lot with the uh, Tachisme, goes against it. Um, uh, together with Yves Klein, uh, they debated who started it, you know, but that's another debate. They started uh, the group called Les Nouveaux Realistes, the New Realists, mm. which they say themselves was, the, and Pierre is a very avid uh, <laughs> propagator for this, that they are the true pop artists. Yeah. Uh, it's, it never happened first in the US, it happened first in France and so on. And he launched this uh, thinking also in Sweden. His articles were translated, he was here, he, he um, lectured, he had his articles in Konstrevi, Paletten and so on. Uh, so I mean, the, 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 in the second exhibition there were all these claims about urban life, about the city being the place where North was born, and mm -hmm. these were claims made by Restani, as I understand it. Can, can, you, can you tell us a little more about what he actually proposed here? So in uh, Super Lund, he's, uh, he's got a, I mean, it's incredibly bold. We've got the book here. It um, looks like this. And he writes, uh, this exhibition is a panorama of the present, but a philosophy for the future. Yeah, yeah. 
and the panorama of the present is all the exhibitions and all the types of art that was in it, which was absolutely everything from moving image to contemporary design, televisions, what have you not. But the philosophy for the future, it's the importance of the urban city. It's in the urban city that everything can happen that makes uh, a human being free. It's uh, freed of uh, bourgeois constraints. This is where all the ugly sides are, the, the um, pollution, uh, poverty, but it's also where the freedom is. So he had this enormous belief in the, in the city. But, uh, and, and also you, you, you look at the program and the thinking and then you, you go to Lund, which is a medieval city, yeah, yeah. and you're thinking something is a mismatch. The thing is though, Restani puts this as his ideas, he claims it. But the exhibition two years earlier by uh, the critic Jean-Jacques Levesque had exactly the same kind of thinking of the importance of the urban environment as the place for freedom for the thought. It's interesting because, uh, as I mentioned, there was a similar exhibition in Stockholm in '65. the opening exhibition at like, the Museum of Architecture, Hey Stahl, you know, Hey, it was like, Hey City, which the claim was you have to embrace the city, you have to, and, I mean, I mean, really similar claims. So they seem to have been in, in the air all over the place. And, mm -hmm. You know of any connection between the two exhibitions, and Hey Stahl, which is also like '65. Uh, no, not uh, anything I have looked at, but I think the connection is the power of that thought. Yeah. And this is uh, something that the artists that were based in Paris mm. really thought of. And they also thought of it in terms of uh, a critique against the cultural politics in France and yeah. in Paris. So some of these uh, artists, particularly the ones participating in the 1965 exhibition, now today would say they didn't really get the same chances to do this kind of experimental exhibitions. And was the Parisian, I mean, the Parisian cultural politics was that was that conservative? At the conservative, yes. very conservative, yeah. as it was perceived conservative. Yeah. There were not the kind of art galleries that would host of this size and this kind of economy. Still, even if they thought they didn't have money, yeah. they yeah. had a lot of money and yeah. technicians, a big audience to try. They're quite new. I mean, these most of these artists are really young. Yeah. Uh, so. They believed in the urban space because also in the urban space yeah. you had more freedom for living whatever sexuality mm. you had. Uh, you didn't have to have an organized uh, nuclear family. I mean, it was a different type of life. Yeah. But art wasn't always free. No. But then, as you write, you know, ten years later, Pierre Sénier would change his mind. I mean, pretty drastically and, and go in the opposite direction. And, mm. and, uh, why was that? Because so, Pierre Sénier. So one of my concepts that I look at largely in, a different, in my overall research during yeah. this project is periphery, what it means. And Peristani is a person who really harbors both the center and periphery in him the whole time. And in his actions, he, I mean, he was traveling, I mean, he's one of the early globetrotting uh, curators. Yeah. He was a curator before the notion. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> he was one week in uh, Poland, uh, the other in Tokyo. Yeah. I mean, as much as you could travel yeah, yeah. as fast across the whole world. In one year he'd been, I don't know how many places. One of the places he really invested in was South America, Argentina, Chile, and Brazil. And he traveled across the Rio Grande. And during that travel, um, with a couple of artists, he met indigenous people. He met the tragedy of, uh, of destroying nature around yeah. them. And he made a complete U-turn and saying, uh, 1967, when I wrote this book, uh, or made this exhibition, yeah. Superlund, believing in the city as the future, I was right that it was a turning point, it was the start of a new modernity, but I was wrong about what it contained. Yeah. It's the nature we have to look at. Uh, it's uh, the city that destroys it. Yeah. So was that part of the growing ecology movement, maybe? I mean, there are similar thoughts happening. I mean, in the mid '60s, there are all these things written about the city, you know, by philosophers, theorists, and architects. You know, right from Aldo Rossi to Robert Ventura in the U.S. And so, I guess this fascination with the city as a new as a new urban form of life is all over the place. And ten years later, you find the ecological turn because of many books that were published. So, so I guess this this somehow U turn is also part of a larger turn. That that. But coming back to this ex exhibition, I mean, I mean, ob obviously one of the things that strikes you from a contemporary press is 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 just man. There are very few women involved in it, but I know you had this. this the, uh, the the director has some pretty specific ways of dealing with that. Mm -hmm. 
So Eja Hagestedt uh, is, I mean, the obvious answer, answer is it's the 60s. Yeah. Um, it's interesting in the foreword of Le Merveilleux Modern, which Eja Hagestedt was part of selecting the artists. He writes, uh, they took an, uh, a decision only to show ex- uh, artists from Western Europe, mm. not Eastern Europe. So mm. he's very aware of that kind of yeah, dichotomy yeah, yeah, and problem. Yeah, yeah. But they don't mention that we took the decision to only show 99% men. They had Nikki de Sanfal in the yeah. exhibition as the only, one, only woman. Uh, it's not in any way addressed or problematized during the present mm. in that by no. critics, no. by anybody. No. Uh, writing about it, being heard, at, at least that you can look at today. Yeah. But in his overall work, Eja Hagestedt is one of the first people to really accommodate women artists, feminists' mm. work. For example, uh, in Malmö 1974, he, he welcomed an exhibition about Kvinnoliv, I think it's called. Uh, he invested in uh, showing it artists like Magdalena Ab- uh, Abakanovic from Poland mm. again and again mm. and again. Uh, because of not just that she's a woman mm. but because of her art is interested, mm. interesting and he's really he had a real concern from what it seems from reading what he's been doing and interviewing people worked with him that his real concern was what kind of place can an art public art gallery be what responsibility have we running a public mm. art space what responsibilities have we got to be a voice in society mm. So when you look at the fuller program, um, there are women artists, feminist artists, textile art. There is art from uh, across the whole world. There's art from uh, South America, from uh, Eastern Europe. There's architecture, mm. city planning. Mm. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. it's the whole range. It's in some ways the programs between 67 and 1980 that I looked at, Lund Konstell and Malmö Konstell, reflects the kind of art history that me and many of my colleagues strive to teach today. Mm. They had it already in the program then. Yeah. So there must obviously be a PhD written on him soon. That's the term. I <laughs> know. <laughs> there should be. I mean, there's so many books on Ponsetien, which of course he deserves, but I mean, I mean, for me he was completely unknown. So, mm. so there should obviously be something done about this. Mm. I, I agree with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Kanske har du Ja. Mm. Ja. Det är bra. Är det något mer du tycker?